In Cairo, a muezzin calls faithful Muslims to prayer. It's the same call that sounds five times a day, every day, in cities across the world. Nearly a quarter of the people on earth respond to it bound together by the enduring spirit of Islam. God is most great, the Muezzin calls. I testify there is no other God but God. I testify Muhammad is the messenger of God. Come and pray. Come and flourish. God is most great. There is no God but God. In the unfolding of history, Islamic civilization has been one of humanity's grandest achievements. A worldwide power founded simply on faith. A spiritual revolution that would shape the nations of three continents and launch an empire. For the West, much of the history of Islam has been obscured behind a veil of fear and misunderstanding. Yet Islam's hidden history is deeply and surprisingly interwoven with Western civilization. It was Muslim scholars who reclaimed the ancient wisdom of the Greeks while Europe languished in the Dark Ages. It was they who sowed the seeds of the Renaissance 600 years before the birth of Leonardo da Vinci. From the way we heal the sick, to the numerals we use for counting, cultures across the globe have been shaped by Islamic civilization. But all this began with the life of a single, ordinary man and the profound message he proclaimed would change the world forever. His name was Muhammad. To Muslims, the life of Muhammad is a story revered. In its mysteries as much as its certainties, there are beliefs held sacred. Whatever we can tell about the Prophet, of course, is screened through the filter of what has been preserved over the centuries and what people have wanted to preserve. And it's very difficult to pull out from all of these different sources that are very adoring and the ordinary human being, that, uh, the, the, the person that he was. We do know that Muhammad was born in or around 570 AD in the sun-blasted Arabian Peninsula, a land of savage scarcity whose Bedouin tribes were locked in a constant state of tribal war.
While still an infant, Muhammad's parents gave him his first taste of life in the desert. Muhammad was from a town, Mecca, but he was sent off to live with the Bedouin because the people, even in the town of Mecca, felt that the Bedouin were the holders of the, the deeper cultural Arab values. And the Bedouin view the townspeople as having lost their really authentic roots in Arab culture and the poetry and, and uh, animal husbandry and all the things that uh, they, they do so well. By the time Muhammad was six, both of his parents had died, and he was taken under the protection of his uncle, chief of his clan. Being an outsider gave him a singular perspective. He'd been orphaned early and developed very early on a passionate sense of concern for those who are left out of society. Uh, to be orphaned in a tribal society where clan and family relationships are your keys to everything, success, status, honor, dignity, um, is, is to face what it really feels like to be marginalized. And that obviously had a, a, a very deep impression on him as a young man. In some ways, it was detrimental, of course, to grow up without parents, but in other ways, he was so adaptable. He had many parents, he had many fathers, he had many mothers, so it made him a child of everybody. Muhammad's clan, like Arabs all across the Arabian Peninsula, would share the stories that had been told and retold for generations. Pre-Islamic Arabian civilization was largely an oral culture and uh, was tremendous respect for and admiration for people who could express themselves orally, and especially those who could recite poetry almost at the drop of a hat. Some of the most important people in a tribe were the poets. As they sang of the glory of the tribe, they they, taught, they told the story of the tribe. To the Bedouin, the word had a mystical importance. Poets linked the tribe to its ancestors and celebrated values older than memory. Poetry was the sinew that bound the Bedouin together, celebrating their victories, lamenting their defeats. The poems themselves, like the poems of Homer, both celebrate this great heroic ethos and yet intimate in the deepest way the tragedy that um, this war, this ethos of constant tribal warfare uh, brings to people. Warfare and conflict were the grim realities of a dangerous time. Muhammad's uncle taught him the skills he'd need to survive in a world where even a prophet would wield a bow and arrow. In a wilderness punished by the elements and bereft of water, rivalry over a single well could provoke a blood feud for generations. A real rivalry, real battles, and sometimes quite bloody. So the allegiance of individuals was to the family immediately and, at a larger extent, to the tribe. Without the tribe's protection, no one could endure. Scattered across the peninsula were countless factions, all embroiled in bitter struggles, each defending its precious grazing lands, trade routes and, most importantly, its wells. Well, you have to understand, and most of the lands are dry. And so water is, is something that oh, everyone always considers precious. For those of us in climates that are more heavily watered, it's difficult to understand the depth and the centrality of the symbol of water in societies that uh, are desert and in which uh, it only rains once or twice a year and in which uh, a little water makes the difference between life and death. Each clan had its own separate gods and totems, to water and wind, fire and night. They were kept in the caravan town of Mecca, 
in a shrine of wood, stone and cloth. It was called the Kaaba, the Arabic word for cube. Pre-Islamic Arabs worshipped a number of spirits, and they were generally nature-oriented spirits, sometimes associated with natural, natural features like trees or rocks or springs. And uh, the Kaaba in Mecca was one of a number of these sanctuaries centered around a particular cluster of deities. It was said the Hebrew patriarch Abraham himself built the Kaaba centuries before and that a sacred black stone it held within had fallen from the sky. In these turbulent times, the Kaaba provided a rare place of peace. Only here would the Bedouin submit to a temporary truce before returning to their conflicts of the open sands. There was this one place in the middle, around the Kaaba, which was, from even pre-Islamic times, was a place of uh, a sacred enclosure where all people had to put down their arms. And this, of course, facilitated trading uh, because it meant that you couldn't carry on your feuds when you were doing your buying and selling. The spiritual and economic importance of the Kaaba and Mecca are pretty hard to separate in, in, as far as the pre-Islamic Arabs are concerned. The Kaaba made Mecca a vibrant center for trade. Here were found Arabian incense, exotic perfumes and Indian spices, Chinese silks and Egyptian linens. But perhaps the greatest treasure to be found at Mecca was the rich mixture of cultures. There were people who came through town who had all kinds of interesting experiences to relate to faraway places. The local religion was mixed. There were Christians, there were Jews, and there were also the Arabs of the desert who followed an animist type of religion. Muhammad's world was a center of trade, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean linking the aging empires of Byzantium and Persia to the great bazaars of India and China. Muhammad became a merchant. In fact, he had a great flair for trade. At the age of 25, while leading a caravan northward to Syria, his talents caught the eye of the shipment's owner, a wealthy widow named Khadija. She was so taken with Muhammad, she proposed marriage. Ah, Khadija. Well, I think she was a mentor as well as a wife, a very strong lady who had her own business, and Muhammad was helping her out. So it was a wonderful partnership, and I'm sure he 